uh, yeah. Yeah. Me. All right. Um, well, we'll get started then. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my background um, is in the kind of commercial maritime industry. Um, I've been on cruise ships for about the last kind of six years or so. Um, so yeah, there's me as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, enthusiastic young go-getter. Um, before I kind of realised, oh, actually, this kind of going away for like four months um, at a time kind of didn't really suit the lifestyle that I wanted. Um, so I moved to something a bit closer to home, the Red Funnel Ferries, for those who are familiar. Um, and then during that time, um, I've done some kind of postgraduate study with a focus on um, the human element. Um, most of my postgraduate research um, was focused on checklists, so checklist design, um, checklist content to try and assist people um, in those kind of, in those um, stressful kind of high workload situations. Um, so that's, that's been my kind of background, really. Okay, so um, what we're going to cover, um, a little bit about situational awareness, um, how we understand kind of the world around us, how that leads on into decision making, um, a little bit about fight or flight responses, um, and then kind of how we can, how we can handle that um, to ensure that we kind of respond to emergencies appropriately. So we'll start off with a bit about situational awareness. So my first question would be then, what is situational awareness? I mean, we throw the term around a lot. Obviously, this guy kind of doesn't have much. Um, but what does it what does it kind of mean to you? If you just put your kind of your um, your answers into the chat, I've got my chat up here. Um, yeah, what what do you think that term means? Could be to do with priorities. Okay, a in what way? Um. Well, you should know if you're situate if you if you aware of the situation, you then got to prioritise which parts of those awareness are important and which can be put down the priority list. Okay, yeah. So um, is that you can't expect to prioritise your workload unless you have an, an basically situational awareness. That's kind of like a foundation to decision making and being able to prioritise. Um, Peter King, aware of your surroundings. That's a really good one. Maintaining perspective. Eyes in the back of your head, Julie. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Um, it's basically kind of our understanding of the world around us. So this is the official definition. Ensley um, was a researcher working in the 1990s, and he, he was kind of a bit of a heavyweight, really. Um, this is the same definition that's used in aviation human factors training. Um, and commercial maritime human factors training at the moment. So it's the perception of elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, a little bit technical, the comprehension of their meaning and the project projection of their status in the, near, in the near future. So what does that mean? Well, it basically means first we perceive things, i.e. I get kind of stimulus through my senses. I can see things. So I'm out on the water, I'm, look, I'm keeping a good lookout. So I'm seeing other boats around me by sight as well as hearing. So I'm looking out for things. It's basically our perception of um, touch, feel, smell, sight and hearing. And all of that information gets, fee gets fed into our comprehension. And that means that essentially we take what we see around us and we mold it into a kind of mental picture. So that's what comprehension is, i.e. we see a couple of masthead lights, just white lights, and it's our comprehension that then says, right, well, that's a power-driven vessel over 50 metres or so on. So the comprehension is your cortex, basically. It's kind of like the, um, the figuring out part of your brain, if you like. Once we've understood the situation, well, OK, that's great. So now we understand what's going on. We then come to projection. So that is right, this is the situation right now, how's it likely to evolve in the future? So I'm saying, right, okay, I've seen that power-driven vessel, I've comprehended that it's a power-driven vessel, now I think about risk of collision, so I project the movement of the two vessels and I kind of determine whether that's going to be a problem for me. 
So that's the kind of chain of events when we build up our mental picture, perception, comprehension, and projection. And it's a nice little experiment to do when I'm kind of doing these talks and trying to understand comprehension, because it's quite, a, um, it's quite an abstract topic. If you look at what you're looking at right now, the room around you in your computer, and then you shut your eyes, you've turned off your perception. But if you think about it, you can still picture the room where you're sat. That picture of the room around you when your eyes are closed is basically your comprehension, your mental model of what's around you. And that's happening all the time. So, okay, this is great. But the problem is that we can see how we've got a chain kind of um, going on. We've got perception linking into comprehension, linking into projection. So if one of those elements is incorrect, well, then it has a knock on effect. And then suddenly our kind of view of the world, our situational awareness can deviate from the reality. And um, this can happen quite often with students. I, you think that you're in a, um, I know, a rule 18 situation, when in fact, it's a rule 14 situation. You've miscomprehended it or you haven't seen that other vessel, so you didn't perceive it. So situational awareness isn't infallible. So the limits to our situational awareness then, how observant realistically are we? And how observant are our students? So I've got a couple of tests for you here. Is everybody able to see that on their screen? Um, see what, sorry. Uh, it should come up with who done it and then some suspicious characters. No, no. I see the PowerPoint. Okay. How about now? No. no. All right. One second. Oh, hello. Oh, <laughs> hello. Yeah, sorry. Not probably not a very glamorous angle for me. Apologies. <laughs> How about now? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Come up. Right. So, this is a perception test. All right. So, I won't say anything more, but you have been warned. All right. Somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? So did anyone spot any changes? Yes. Okay. Yes. What did you spot? Yeah. <laughs> Um, the bear behind the uh, maid with the bedpans changed into a suit of armour. Okay, yep. Yeah. Anything else? How the many people was did you holding a uh, rolling pin and then a candlestick. Yep. Uh, one, two, three, four. The uh, four. waistcoat colour of the guy on the ground changed. Yep. The clock on the floor the clock changed on the floor, as well. Peter. Yep. All right. I'll play the rest of the video and you'll see what happened. <clears throat> Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts and precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. 
I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So, did it? I'm guessing nobody got 21. <laughs> it's amazing how much you miss. I mean, we'd all probably admit to saying, oh, well, I, I kind of think of myself as relatively perceptive. Um, but yeah, I didn't get all of those changes. Um, Peter saying that the clock was changed. Um, yeah, kind of fantastic observation. However, the whole person changed. It was a different murder. Um, what happened there was that you experienced something called change blindness. Now, change blindness refers to the tendency we have to miss changes in our immediate environment. So what happens is, is that we perceive things and then we filter out the background. And we do that to conserve mental effort, basically. So when I'm looking at that power driven vessel, I'm now focusing on the power driven vessel, not the background which means that potentially I miss something else coming up. So this is a really big problem then, isn't it? Because our perception feeds into our comprehension and projection. So if we don't perceive things, well then our view of the world is incorrect, which obviously has major, major kind of um, consequences when we then use that situal, situational awareness for our decisions. So, another exercise then. Can everyone see this? Uh, I should have, it should come up with the video now. Just seeing your folder at the moment, Aiden. Okay, all right, I don't wanna to give too much away. Hmm. I'll stop share. Sorry, one second. Okay, how about now? Yeah. yeah. All right, so another situational awareness test, another perception test. Now, and this one is gonna ask you to um, observe a series of actions by the people in the video. challenge how many people in orange shirts get subs now when i first did this i misunderstood what he meant by subs and i got like two so it's more than that the subs are basically like the the foil wrappers right that they throw out so how many people in orange shirts get thrown a foil wrapper Did anyone get seven? No. Okay. No, it's jumping around a little bit, Aiden. So I'm not sure we actually saw every every frame. Okay. It, it's, are people able to see these see these videos in kind of a quality to be able to to kind of get something from it? The first one, yes. The second one just jumped about a bit, mate. It might just be the internet. Ah, oh, right. Okay. All right. I'll, um, I'll just finish it out if, if some people were able to see it. Shirts got subs. But what else did you see? Did you notice the ice cream truck change to a pizza truck? Did you notice glasses? 
What about the man leaving the suspicious package next to the truck? Your next challenge, be aware of your surroundings. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Huh. Did anyone notice the background changes? No. So why was that then? Because you were given fair warning that this was a perception test and that things change in the background. So why do you think you missed it? You were given a point of... Yeah. What was that, sorry? Yeah. You're given a specific thing to look at, so your brain tunes into focusing on that one type of object and yeah. scans the background until it finds what it wants. Yeah, kind of. So um, essentially the, the difference there was that you were given a task to do. And what you experienced was a phenomenon called tunneling. Um, it's also called fixation, if you've come across that term before. It basically means that well, we've only got a spotlight of attention. It's a bit like your eyesight, right? So we've got a very small thing in focus and then the rest is peripheral. It's exactly the same with our attention. So we have a spotlight of attention and we can only see changes within that spotlight. What tunneling does is that the attention, it's, it's kind of like tunnel vision, basically. Our attention is focused into that one task and then we miss the overall picture. Um, but what's the problem with that for our situational awareness? Well, we're only looking at one thing to the exclusion of all others. So yeah, exactly. we're not emotionally aware. <laughs> yeah, so I'm focusing on that one vessel. But what about everything else around me? What about the vessel overtaking me or the vessel coming from my other side? Ideally, when we talk about situational awareness, we talk about a kind of helicopter view of the situation in our surroundings. And tunneling takes that away from us. Can you think of any activities on board which would be um, which would be a kind of danger for people getting into this kind of tunneled state? People who, yeah, Go on, sorry, um, people who are what I call instrument checkers. Okay. So they spend a lot of time looking at the instruments and not necessarily looking always beyond what's going on around them yeah exactly With, to the detriment of their situational awareness most of the time yeah. um, with that in mind i was gonna say like night sorry peter i was gonna say night like navigation where you'd sort of give a task to a student to look for a boy um yes they're going to be looking for that boy but now they've suddenly lost their situational awareness to the big ship coming so as an being aware of that if you give tasks to the students that's it really they're not going to be observed as observant on their situation yeah basically think, whenever we um, whenever we give someone a task you're thinking well okay they're gonna it's easy for them now to direct all of their focus into that one thing the boy is all they're looking for as he said to the detriment of all else um and so where the vessel is actually drifting or moving might not get picked up one if I might add, one of the um, best is, I was about to say, Alex, was the, the absolute focus on the fender when you do uh, MOBs under sail or MOBs under yeah. motor. The, every, any other vessel around, any other potential dangers are completely ignored. And, and this is a very good example of that for me. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a really good example. Yeah, sorry, Alex. I, um, I think your, your message came through on my chat exactly as Hayley was explaining it. That's yeah. a really interesting one, actually, is that... Um, yeah, in kind of emergency situations, this tunneling effect is amplified from our stress in our workload. So if we were able to simulate and I was able to induce a tunneled state into you in your room when you're nice and relaxed and maybe with a cup of coffee, you can imagine if you were stressed out on the water, the effect of that kind of, you know, I'm um, shutting down the periphery and just having that one spotlight of focus. Um, going back to Julie, what you were saying, Checking the instruments, yes, but particularly if there's any abnormal situations or any kind of abnormalities with the instrument. I don't know whether anyone's have it, had it where you're kind of cruising along and then suddenly there's a bit of a problem with the chart plotter 
or the speed log or something. And then before you know it, everyone's kind of huddled, clouded around the cockpit, kind of looking, all oh, right, what's going on? And it's like, is this really the most important thing going on at the moment or should our focus be elsewhere? So the other thing is, is that our comprehension and projection, well, that requires some knowledge and experience to be able to form that picture. So, for example, our, my comprehension of um, uh, a rules of the road situation or our comprehension of a rules of the road situation will be different from our students because we have extra knowledge and um, experience to draw back on, which allows us to more accurately um, project into the future and more accurately anticipate the actions of the other vessels. So that's something else that we've got to think about in terms of the limits to our um, our students' situational awareness is that sometimes even if they perceive things and they don't fall foul to the tunnel vision, they may not have the ability to comprehend and then project what's happening. So then how do we make sure that that doesn't happen and how do we make sure that people's situational awareness isn't compromised? Well, there's a clue on the screen and that is communication. So this diagram here that we see on the left, my situational awareness can only be so good. It's not godlike. And so therefore the ideal situational awareness, complete awareness of my surroundings will always kind of be out of reach to me because I'm only one human. However, a team can have a much better understanding of the situation, all the situation around them rather than just one person. And that's part of the reason why teams tend to perform better at tasks compared to individuals is because they're, now they're operating from a shared situational awareness, which is much larger than any one person can have. Um, briefings, well, why is a briefing important in terms of situational awareness? Um. Why is a briefing important? Mm. Um, it, it's telling the student possibly what they they should be looking for and hence educating them on their perception. Okay. What could be the danger of that though? Telling them to look for something. Tunnel vision, going back to the tunnel vision again. Then they're focused on, on that hazard. I, okay, look out for, look out for the cross current. And then when they're going along, all they're focused on is when the cross current is going to come to the detriment of all else. Yeah. But I, but I certainly see what you're saying. I, in my briefing, in terms of my situational awareness, I've perceived something. So therefore, I'm going to share that with the group to kind of build our team situational awareness. I totally get that. That's yeah. completely valid. Anything else? Give them more than one thing to look out for so they're not totally focused. So you want to know what boys are, what boats are around, anything like that. Giving them more than one thing to look for so that they scan for any of those objects rather than tunnel visioning. Yeah, make it broad, essentially. I And even say, you know, I always end my briefings with like, OK, so that's that's what I think. But that's not an exhaustive list. The briefing is important because it's basically sharing, right, this is my model of the situation. My model is, for example, right, we're leaving this pontoon um, and because of the perceived wind from the stern, I'm going to um, use a forward spring to get the stern into the wind and back out. And so I'm sharing my situa situational awareness with you. And from that, from that briefing, you can then check my actions against my situational awareness. So for example, let's say, right, I've said in my briefing, I'm going to use the forward spring to come off the pontoon. If I then start coming in, if I then let go the forward spring and come into a stern, then suddenly you're aware that, well, hang on, he said he was gonna do something different and now the plan's totally changed. So I don't know what's going on. The briefing allows people to question you and say, right, this is what I'm going to do. If I do something different, well, then actually you can pick up on it and you can talk to me. And then that means that my limits 
if I do something wrong because of, you know, I'm only human, then the team can step in and support me. If I don't tell you my plan, well, then I can basically just do anything and everyone else is bystanders. So in bridge resource management and um, in cockpit resource management, they use a mnemonic called PRO, which, call, which stands for plan, reason and outcome. Basically, that's what I would, that's the kind of mnemonic that I would run through before I do kind of any action on board. So let's say, for example, um, we're in a crossing situation with a power driven vessel on our starboard side. So um, I would say, Bob, right, my plan is to alter 60 degrees to starboard. The reason is, is that there's a power driven vessel on my starboard side and I'm the giveaway vessel. And the outcome will be us passing well clear astern with a minimum CPA of one mile. And then that means if suddenly I put the helm over to port, well, then, you know, hang on, that wasn't in the plan. And it also allows you to check my reasoning and check my situational awareness before we act. And so if you get your students to run through this with you and you say, right, what's your plan? What's your reason? And what's the outcome? It allows you to support them much more than if, if they just kind of, all oh, right, I'm just altering to starboard. It's like, right, but what's the result of that? For example, when you say, right, I'm altering to starboard, I'm gonna pass one mile astern. Suddenly, if you're half a mile astern, you can then go, well, hang on, that wasn't in the plan. So something's wrong. It allows you to pick up on, um, on kind of things which aren't meant to happen. Um, so we use that quite a lot, pro, any kind of, on a cruise ship, any course alteration or anything like that, the, um, the navigator, the conning officer will have to go through that process before they put the wheel over. Any questions about that? No? Well, that, that works, Aidan, um, that works in, um, in your environment on the bridge as you're explaining. Um, when you apply that in terms of smaller boats, it's a much faster um, run through, isn't it? If we're on a powerboat doing um, uh, 25 knots with another powerboat approaching from starboard um, at 25 knots, we, we're not necessarily oh, going to yeah. have the time to adapt that. But do we follow that? But what you're saying is, is that is really what we're thinking as we go through the process. We are planning, reasoning and outcoming every time we we are looking at our awareness if you like yeah, our so, situation yeah i see i see what you mean um it doesn't have to be i see what you mean it doesn't have to be a verbal thing it can just be part of your projection so i've i've perceived it i've understood it and my projection is plan reason outcome yeah if yeah. that makes sense that's so how that, i act that, that's yeah, how i act on my yeah. situational awareness does that does that make sense to people Yes, 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 it does. Um, so, yeah, I think also just uh, with with the briefings, um, it did it occurs to me that uh, Judy said to um, allow for, uh, you know, to give them a couple of things to do. But also we have to be very careful that we don't, when we're briefing like that, that we don't give too many things. Because if we give them four or five, they'll forget two or three of them yeah, as we go. What's the limit of our working memory then for the average person? Well, average. Uh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, average. Yeah. <laughs> uh, three, three, four uh, area, really. Yeah, it, it's kind of people say around five, so between seven and three. The environments that we're in, where there's outside stimulus and other things going on, it's almost always at the lower end of that scale because my attention is also going on to other things. I'm not just sat here purely memorizing things. So you're right, you've, you've probably got about four things, let's say, to be able to tell people in the briefing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a really good thing. And that's another limit of situational awareness is, well, how much can I remember about the situation at one time? Yeah. One, of the, one of the things I see is that, is that um, it's getting, when you've got students who are new to the, the environment, they're not, uh, they're not necessarily aware of the what's actually going to happen. So the briefing has got to be in a reasonable amount of detail. You'll probably know that they don't understand some of the things that you're saying, but it's very difficult because 
they're all they haven't come from the same background and uh, spirit. Hmm. I, yeah, I see what you mean. We there's it's a shame that there's not a shortcut to that kind of level of comprehension and understanding to be able to comprehend and project that just comes with experience i think all that we can do mm. in terms of improving our students situational awareness is um is kind of give them some opportunities to to learn and pick up on it um, and also to make sure that that experience is converted into knowledge um, and the way that you do that is basically by having kind of a review reflection talking about it afterwards um, just like we did with those videos Kind of learning through reflection and then that will make that that kind of the benefit from the experience will be exponentially increased after that reflection um moving on then so we've got our perception comprehension and projection well after all of that happens we then act and we make a decision um and for that reason decision making is kind of like the fourth element of situational awareness because we don't just understand our situation and then just kind of sit there we actually act on that information so here's a question then how often do we do we make rational choices <laughs> is a rational choice even possible <laughs> depends on the situation okay what and the stress levels okay yeah really interesting so We've basically got two methods of decision making. We've got intuitive decision making and we've got rational decision making. So you're right. It basically depends on the situation. We'll start off with discussing intuitive decision making. Intuitive decision making is what we call recognition primed decision making. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, it means I've been in a similar situation like this and when I did it last time, I did this and it worked out quite well. So I'm just going to do that thing again. It's a bit like saying, um, like, if you walk into um, if you walk into a school and you walk into a room, your brain goes, well, I think this is a classroom. And you kind of think you say, well, why do I think that this is a classroom? Well, it looks like all of the other classrooms I've been in. So it's recognition primed basically means that I'm recognizing this situation as something similar to what I've experienced in the past. And so therefore, I'm going to use kind of the same method to get me out of the last situation because it worked OK. I when I walk into the classroom, I'm going to sit down and say hello to the teacher because that's what I did last time. And it seemed to go it seemed to go all right. The benefit of intuitive decision making is that it requires very little mental effort. Humans are kind of naturally lazy. And it makes perfect sense. Because I've got a certain amount of glucose and energy in my body and everything I do is trying to conserve that. So if I don't have to expend loads and loads of energy on making a decision and I make thousands and thousands of decisions a day, if all of them were rational, I'd just kind of fall down in a pit of exhaustion. So it's kind of necessary to make intuitive decision making. When you were talking, Julie, about different situations, Intuitive decision making is usually used in time pressured situations with stress. So that is, oh, something's going on, right, uh, intuitive decision making, I'm going to do this without really thinking about it. Um, the problem is, though, is that it doesn't always produce the best result because the situation, even though you recognise it, is similar to something you've experienced. Subtle things about it may mean it's completely different and actually the response needs to be completely different so for example it's like oh i think that this is a classroom but actually no it's something else you know it's like oh, okay this is a cpd session where it's not really like it's a little bit more relaxed than that i mean if i call the teacher sir then i'm gonna look i know like a little bit straight edged or yeah. i think that, i think that this is a i think that this is a crossing situation Oh, but actually, I've got a vessel overtaking me on my other side. So it's kind of a crossing situation and a rule 13 situation. How does that all interact? So sometimes it's not it's not good if there's not a straightforward solution. And subtle things about the situation can mean that it's different, that the action you took last time may not be the best action this time. It uses the emotional part of the brain, which is why that it's linked to stress. 
So I, I'm stressed, I'm kind of more emotional. That's why I fall into intuitive decision making. Rational decision making, on the other hand, um, is also called classical decision making. They say that it's based on reason and logic. So I, okay, right, I'm, I'm kind of starting to think about this a bit more. A good example of the difference between rational and intuitive decision making is, let's say, um, oh right, I'm going to, um, I'm going to pick a, um, a training center to do my yacht master at. And an intuitive decision would be, oh, I'm going to go with, um, I don't know, Aiden's power boating or something because I like the look of the website and I just think I'm going to go there. It just looks like me. A rational decision would be right. I've got a choice between two. I'm going to make a list of pros and cons. That's a rational thing to do is to weigh up the pros and cons of each. So that's a good way that I, I kind of think about it is rational decision making. If I've got a decision, I'll make a list of pros and cons and weigh them up. And intuitive is I'm just going to go and do it. You know, like you go into a shop and you say, oh, I'm just going to grab a Fanta. I'm not going to weigh up the pros and cons of each drink and then decide on a Fanta. Because that would just take too much effort. And that's the critical thing about rational decision making is that, OK, so it can produce a really good result. I'm using my my reason and my logic, but that comes at a cost in time and also workload for the individual. So in a really stressful, high workload situation, lots of things going on, it's unlikely that someone's going to fall into rational decision making. And there's even a kind of philosophical question. Well, does rational decision making even exist or is it just kind of theory? Because when do we actually when do we ever actually think totally rationally? If I were to give you a maths question and say I give you 10 times 40, how would you work it out? At a zero. OK. <laughs> you've taken a, you've taken. I mean, yes, I do as well. You've taken a shortcut there. <laughs> you could also do 40 plus 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 40. And that would be the totally rational way of doing it, wouldn't it? I weighing up the pros and cons 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40. So your brain has taken a shortcut there because it's decided I can't be bothered to do 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40 plus 40. Plus 40. And that is completely natural. And actually, there's been a couple of studies. Basically, what they did is they put some pilots in some really kind of stressful situations. They got them landing. In, it was basically landing in low visibility with one engine, very high workload. And they found that they were expecting them to go into intuitive decision making mode. But they didn't. They were in rational decision making, but they were making shortcuts, just like Julie did with that mass question. And that is the ideal place where we need to be, because then we have the benefits of being kind of rational, but we lower the workload and we lower the time and we're able to do it under more stress. Does that make sense? Yeah. So another question then. This was an experiment done in um, 2010 and then the results were published in 2011. Um, it was done in Israel and it looked in, at the Israeli justice system. So you've got a question here then. Which person out of these is most likely to be given parole from prison? Exactly. And it should be noted, the people are of exactly the same um, ethnic background. So there's no kind of bias comes into it at all. Which one is most likely to be given parole and why? Ace too, because you're more relaxed after a nice lunch, aren't you? Okay, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. That's the critical thing. Basically, the person's the same. They're from the same background. The sentence is, is the same. The only thing that's different is the time. What they did was that they got, um, they got 1,100 people for this sample, and they basically put the same people in front of the parole board at different times again and again, with sufficient stretch so that actually the judges didn't remember them and they went to see a different judge. So the person can be discounted. The sentence is the same, so that can be discounted. The only thing that's different is the time. Do we have any um, 
is everyone in agreement with Peter or do people think differently? I'd say, say I'd say case three because they want to go home. Yeah. Because yeah. they want to go home and they'll just get yeah, just let them out, you know. There's a time so there's a time pressure. Okay, I, I'd say the morning one because you've got more energy and you're more alert in the morning. Well, personally I am, but I'm <laughs> 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 I'd probably go along with Nikki, the, the morning one. You've got time to hear all of the details and probably your most alert. OK. I would say it depends on what's the easier process for them to uh, give them parole. Is it easier to give parole or easier to deny? Is that a factor? Because if it's easier to deny it, then they'll then case three, case one. Sorry, if it's easier to give it then case one will probably be the one that gets parole and the, um, sorry, if it's easier to deny it, then case three will be the one that won't get um, parole. Yeah, now we're thinking. So, case one, you've got an 80% chance of getting out of jail on parole. Case two and three, you've got a 10% chance. So case one was much, much more likely to get parole than case two and three. Now, why is that? Well, it's for the exact reason tired. Nikki said and that Gary was explaining was that in the morning, people generally have more energy. It's a kind of it's a more productive time of the day, 11, 10 a.m. compared to three and four in the afternoon. And as a judge, you're thinking, right, am I gonna let this person out of prison early? Is, is this person a risk? So the easiest choice would be to keep them in jail because then they're no risk to anyone. So, that's, so to answer your question, Gary, the easiest choice is just to keep them in and not let them out early. If I let them yeah. out early, yeah. I need to make a choice to make sure that they're not a risk, which of course, you know, takes effort yeah, yeah, there is. and the reason is is that in case one at 11 10 i've got more energy and therefore i make a more rational decision because i've got the energy to go into it and therefore i think right well on the balance of kind of rationality and reason i think they're not a risk and i'm going to let them out in case two and three, when I'm feeling a little bit more tired, it's getting towards the end of the day, I fall into intuitive decision making because I can't because I don't want the workload of having to make a rational decision. It takes kind of workload and effort. So I fall into intuitive decision making and I say, I'm just going to take the easy choice and kind of not make a decision and then just keep them in. We go on to the next slide. Yeah. This is our daily variation in glucose. And what do you notice about the times? The three to 6 p.m. crash or 4 p.m., 5 p.m. crash. You've got much less glucose at three, between three and six compared to between nine and 10 o'clock is basically the peak. And then 11 o'clock we're on the way down. Do you remember what I said earlier about how making a decision takes energy and I've only got so much of it. My body is designed to conserve glucose because that's what I live off, basically, sugar. If I'm spending all of my glucose on making a big decision, when my glucose are already low, my body sees that as kind of like an impossible choice. And it says, right, I'm just going to get rid of the decision making. I'm not going to put, uh, put myself under that additional strain. I need to conserve my glucose so in terms of making a big life decision you're better off making it at about nine or ten o'clock in the morning according to this this is something um, that human factors experts call um, decision fatigue um, or you may also hear it being called ego depletion as kind of a spin on freudian psychology basically this experiment the one with the parole it demonstrated that there's a finite store of mental energy for exerting self-control and making decisions. And it basically justified, it basically kind of proved that people will go into intuitive decision-making, less rational decision-making when their glucose level 
lowers. Um, I was speaking to one of my friends who's, um, who works in the um, engineering industry. And he said that throughout the office, they go around and they give people um, sweets. And you think, well, why are they giving me sweets? I'm just sat here, I'm not really doing anything. You know, apart from like working hard, I'm just sat at my desk. And it was because they realized in order for the engineers to make the best decision, they need to have a high level of glucose. And so that's why they give people these little top me up sweets um, was because they realized that actually the mental effort takes glucose as well. Going on to the next one. This is our body's circadian rhythm. So i.e. how tired we feel throughout the day. And what do you notice about this, temp this graph? Well, it's based on temperature. You think, oh, okay, right, well, what does that tell me? Basically, your ability, your tiredness is kind of dependent on body temperature. I, when you feel hypothermic, you feel really lethargic and you can't really make a decision and you feel a bit sleepy and tired and you just want to kind of curl up somewhere nice. Whereas if you feel hot, probably the last thing you think about is going to bed and going to sleep. So the circadian rhythm shows, this is for an adult, it shows a big dip between 4 and 8 a.m. and then another big dip after 12. So kind of um, there we have in the morning a big kind of lapse fall in temperature, meaning that our decision making is compromised about kind of three or four o'clock in the morning, which is when an adult is most at sleep. And so what that means is when you're planning your watch schedule, you need to take into account that the person on the midnight till 4am watch, their decision making is probably going to be in part compromised by their circadian rhythm. And they're more likely, if they're tired, to fall into intuitive decision making again. So that may mean um, giving them some extra reports. So they may decide, oh, actually, I'm going to put two people on that watch, something like that. I know that that's not always possible, you know, on a yacht and so on. Um, but from a human factors point of view, you would say, well, that's the critical time for accidents to happen. And part of the reason why is that the decision making of the people at that time isn't going to be as good. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about what we've about what we just covered? Um, so we've been talking for kind of an hour now. My plan was if we just take a quick kind of five minute, 10 minute coffee break um, to kind of boost our levels of rational decision making. <laughs> I think I, even I'm falling into that dip of making intuitive choices now. So I think why don't we give ourselves a bit of a break, say, um, should we give ourselves um, between 10, 15 minutes? something like that. So mm -hmm. if we just say, um, we'll be, I'll start again at um, quarter past. And if we're all here a bit early, well then um, we can get going a bit sooner. During the break, what I'd like you to do is have a look at this case study. Now the link is on the PowerPoint. If you can't copy it on your screen, I'll put it into the chat so that you can just look at it straight away. Are you able to kind of copy and paste that link from the screen? No, okay. Uh, do the times vary um, depending on food intake or sleep? Uh, sorry, Gary, I just saw that. Um, yes, when we talk about the circadian rhythm, i.e. that dip at night, that is for a normal adult kind of going to bed at about kind of 10 o'clock or something like that and waking up at about seven or eight o'clock. So when you make your watch schedule, you have to be aware that OK, so after the first week, when someone's converted onto almost like a different time zone 
and you think, right, they, they're now used to getting up at 12, they're going to have their dip um, just after they go, about a couple of hours before they go to sleep. So it right. does kind of, it does vary on essentially that rhythm. The timings change depending on when you go to bed. Yeah, they move, they move accordingly. Once you've acclimatized, it's like um, jet lag, I suppose. Exactly, yeah. yeah. What well, if you've acclimatized to a different time scale, you will have the same graph with the dip um, when you're most at sleep. Um, but yes, the timings will change. In terms of the glucose levels, that is also based on a waking up, having breakfast at eight, and then you have kind of lunch, 12, one o'clock, and then you have dinner at five. So it's basically just yeah. after lunch. Yeah. Okay. When you have the glue. Yeah. So, yeah. So always, always just keep your sleep pattern to UT. But, um, you were playing the, were you playing the YouTube clip unmuted and therefore you were getting the sound all the time? Because there was, I think um, I could hear the, uh, the YouTube clip that I was trying to watch plus other people listening to it <laughs> <laughs> at different times, which caused my, uh, caused trouble with my tunnel focus. <laughs> Good multitasking. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's an interesting, it's an interesting point though about multitasking, isn't it? Can we multitask? Can no. You <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Can you listen to two videos at once? You can't. <laughs> what can what actually happens if we're juggling, um, say, two or two or more tasks? What actually happens is that we just flick attention between one and then the other, really fast, and we kid ourselves that that means we're doing both at the same time. But in fact, we're not. And they did a couple of studies into this, and they asked people, "Well, are you good at multitasking?" And the majority of them went, "Well, yeah, I'm very good at multitasking." And they thought, "Well, no, you're not." Why do you, you why do you have that perception? Um, of course you can't multitask. And it was because say so I have two tasks. When my attention is on one task, I disregard the other. So I'm no longer paying attention to this. Then I flick back to this one, and now I'm no longer paying attention to this. And because people weren't paying attention to their bad performance in one area, they thought that they were doing a really good job. But it was just because you weren't you weren't multitasking, so therefore you weren't able to judge your performance on both tasks. So yeah, multitasking is a complete myth. Mm. I saw that study because they were trying to because lots of women say they can multitask because they're mothers or whatever, and they would basically were just disbanding the myth that they could actually do that because they, you can only like you say you can only focus on one thing at a time. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. It's just because you're you're not aware of how bad you're doing that you think that you're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like the um uh what is it the droning cougar effect i'm ignorant of the things i'm ignorant of so therefore i don't know how much i'm ignorant of you know that's why we have you know like sometimes beginner students thinking that they're the bee's knees is that you're you're ignorant of the things you don't know and you don't appreciate the scale the amount of knowledge that you haven't understood yet so you think it's really easy Um, do we have only everyone back? Um, I'm here. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I'm here. I'm um, here. I've got my tea. You're missing David Warder. I don't know where he's gone. Oh, hang on. Let me check my. Ah, uh, yes, we're down to. We started with twelve. We're down to eleven. We're not supposed to record that in the log. <laughs> <laughs> Mob. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we can't focus on your lecture, Aiden. We have to go. Get them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, what we um is twenty past. What I think what we'll do is we'll um we'll press on, and then if he if he's like because of internet um issues, if he just flicks back on well then we'll just do a quick recap and then we can then we can carry on um carry on from there i'm just kind of aware of the aware of the time um i haven't got a call from him or anything saying that he's having um having trouble
Um, so yeah, I, I think we'll probably because of time, I reckon we'll probably just kind of press on. Um, right, let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Yes. Feeling refreshed and caffeinated? Getting there. <laughs> so, um, what did people think of the case study? In interesting. I didn't get all the way through it, but it was yeah, no um, assumptions made. Okay. And lack of people kind of following the protocols that were laid down okay yeah kind of um i mean it, it wasn't the greatest display of watch keeping ever was it? <laughs> it it seemed to me as if it went wrong from right from the word go because he got thing assumed things wrong right from the word go hmm. one of the things i sort of picked up on which was interesting was um that uh, you know, people create have a perception, and then if the situation changes, they still try and make that fit with their perception, um, rather than actually completely stopping and reevaluating, which seemed to be contributory. Yeah, yeah. Paul, you're you bang see that a lot in navigation. You're bang on the money, and that is basically our situational awareness isn't fixed. It's not like right now I've understood the situation. It's a constant process of um, of kind of. Getting your getting input from perception, making sense of it, and then projecting it. Um, so yeah, the the fixed situational awareness um, was one of the big outcomes of this. Is that yeah, it's um you need to be constantly updating it all the time. Um, and what you mentioned there, the the technical word for it is confirmation bias, and that is that essentially the brain doesn't like to be wrong. We always like to be right all the time, and so if I've got my if I've got my view, I will tend to find information that supports it and disregard information that undermines it. Um, that's not like a, that's not a political thing. It's actually in this case, it's kind of just real life. I have my perception of this situation and I'll welcome information that supports it and anything that goes against my model, I'll try and suppress. So it's, it's about kind of being, um, being aware of our own kind of, um, I don't know, um, limitations, I suppose, and realise, you know, actually I'm not perfect. I can fall into these traps. Um, and yeah, I've got to be constantly questioning myself. So how do you know that your situational awareness is good? You don't crash. Continuous I mean, monitoring. Okay, continuous monitoring, but of what? What would you be monitoring? What are you what are you trying to to prove? Well, you want planned make... outcomes, and if you're monitoring whether you meet those planned outcomes, you fit your target. So okay. your outcomes need to be measurable, so you know whether you've got that. Bang on! You've got an outcome, i.e., this is my model, and this is my projection. I think. The report says that it was the clear perception of both officers that it was a stationary object near the shore. I'm expecting those lights to stay pretty fixed relative to me. If they start to move, well then I know, hang on, something's a bit wrong here because this doesn't suit my projection. So what I'm doing is it's a bit like hypothesizing, like I think this is going to happen. If it doesn't happen, well then my model's wrong. If everything I'm expecting to happen happens, well, then I must have pretty good situational awareness. So your, your projections, your predi predictions on the situation, if they're not coming true, well, then something's wrong with your model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Was there anything else that came out of it um, for anyone? Just that it reminded me a lot of students doing their first night nav whenever they see any big vessel in the Solent and they always miss the big vessel. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, kind of like, um, it's not like um, 
change blindness, that's something slightly different, but it's basically you miss the elephant in the room. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean there's, there's things about the deck lights being on and so on. And that's basically a perception error and that you haven't realised that it's there. So therefore you haven't comprehended it. Yeah. The report said something about better use of AIS and other things. So I assume that the officer was just using his visual and he wasn't using all the inputs. Why wasn't he using all the inputs then? Because he would have been trained and I'm sure that someone must have told him at some point you need to keep a lookout by all available means. So why didn't he? Overconfidence. The tunnel Assumptions. vision again. Yeah. Possibly. What did it what did it say about um about what he was doing at the time? Oh, I didn't see. He was training. It says uh, the officer of the watch was training two junior trainees at the time. And we can't multitask. So his attention was going into the trainees. I'm doing my training. And then that's why he wasn't really keeping a very good lookout is because he was focused on a different task. And so that's another kind of um, that's another limitation of his situa situational awareness is that it's basically his spotlight of attention was focused elsewhere. We're really bad at holding our attention to something. It's called monitoring fatigue. That is it's like we're bad at monitoring instruments. That's why we have alarms to do it for us so that we can focus on the bigger picture. And we're also very bad at coping with distraction. So that is my attention is on you. I get distracted and then I come back to you and I'm like, right, where was I? So if our attention and our focus is interrupted, it's very difficult to get back again. And it's the same with our situational awareness. If I have situational awareness, if I lose it because I'm distracted and then I come back to it, suddenly I have to build up my situational awareness again. Situa situational awareness has to be built over time, um, which is why the fact that this occurred very soon after a watch handover is also a factor, is that you can't, you don't just kind of walk up to the, you don't kind of, I don't know, walk up from the accommodation up to the bridge or the cockpit and then have situational awareness. It's got to be built up over time. And so that's part of it was that that incoming officer didn't have time to build up the picture of what was going on. Um, quickly, was there anything else for anyone that came up? I think the piece about VTS just missing the ball completely as well is, is quite a big, big part of it. Mm. Yeah, not, um, not tracking it. I mean, I'm calling up saying that there's a frigate off my port bow and then not knowing what it is is yeah is a bit of a failing <laughs> yeah i suppose that's also um part of your awareness isn't it they um they were reliant part of his reliance was on the vts mm. and that probably took away some of his focus on his situational awareness he was reliant on another input yeah and in terms of our in terms of our working memory as well, you notice when it came up, the frigate called in to VTS saying, I'm a frigate. <laughs> but the situational, the VTS operator didn't plot him in the system. He just came up as a radar echo. Now, why he did that um, wasn't explained in the video. But it's possible that he thought, well, I'll just remember that that target is the frigate. But of course, that relies on your working memory, which may be exceeded and you may be distracted by other things. So I think perhaps overconfidence on the part of the VTS operator as well. Don't you trust yourself to remember these things. Write it down. Yeah. Cool. All right. So moving on, then um, we're going to go into kind of the, the second part of the um, of the session, which is about kind of handling handling emergencies and what we do when we're. Um, when we're under pressure. So the alarm reaction is colloquially called the flight, um, fight or flight, fight, flight or freeze response, um, but its proper name is the alarm reaction. Um, has anyone experienced what they, what they think is a fight or flight moment? Yes. Okay. Um, would you mind kind of telling us a little bit about what happened and, and focus on um, what you what you felt 
um, kind of biologically? Um, it's it's a, a kind of panic reaction. Okay. Not yep. panic reaction. Yep. Um, the one that comes to mind, which was a kind of, do I jump off the boat or do I get on the radio or do I scream loudly, was um, brand new boat. We were throwing it round a bit and went into a turn and wouldn't come out. Didn't matter how hard you pulled the steering, she wouldn't straighten up. So we dropped the power. And then heard a squeak for the engine bay, looked in the engine bay, and the engine was, both of them were half submerged in seawater. Wow. So the fact it hadn't quite reached the breathers, which is the only reason she hadn't actually stalled. Um, so we're looking for holes. We're kind of got this boat that's now sitting very low in the water. And it was an Italian boat. I won't say the make, but the bilge pumps could be turned off on the main control panel. They weren't wired in permanently. Mm. So we hit every switch, every manual bilge pump and the level started coming down. But it was that lifting up that hatch and looking in that engine and thinking, we're gonna sink, how fast are we gonna sink? Are we gonna jump? And I've got two, a couple very new to boating. And it was kind of, oh shit moment, alarm yeah. reaction. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, um the, the picture I chose, there's loads of pictures. I chose this one because it's kind of primordial. Um, it's, it's a kind of primordial instinctual response um, that you feel. And, and what were you feeling kind of, um, what, was, what was your body feeling like? We'll focus on that first, kind of the biological effects of going through this. Um, it was a freeze to start with and then hyperaction. Okay. Um, Interesting. Everything you go in the fight mode, the flight mode comes in and your brain starts working at 2000 miles an hour. You're ready to jump at anything. Um, sound becomes amplified. Um, awareness becomes amplified. Um, and it's you've, you've just got to kind of step back and go right back in control and logically analyze it. Mm, really, really interesting. Um, I'll come back to kind of the mental side of it. Basically, what happens is that this is your response um, if you have a stimulus which you which you perceive to be immediately threatening. Um, so it's a um, it's based off kind of basically I don't know stepping on a snake, or something like that. That would induce an alarm response in everybody. Um, it's a primordial reaction which served us really well kind of in times gone by. However, nowadays, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a bit of a limitation, really. What happens is, if you go into a situation you perceive to be immediately really threatening, biologically, your heart rate jumps, your blood pressure increases, increases you have vasodilation, your blood sugar rises because your body expects to be doing a lot of mental and physical work. Respiration increases, muscles tense up, perforation increases, pupils dilate, and your vision tunnels. And that's a bio that's not um, that's not a psychological tunneling on a task. That's a physical. Your peripheral vision will decrease, and your um, and your focus will become smaller. And it's important to mention that this happens when it's a perceived threat, not an actual one. So it's not based on objectivity, it's based on subjectivity. That means that we've probably all experienced a student having some kind of a alarm reaction to a situation that we've, we feel is actually perfectly safe. So it's a perceived reaction, it's, it's not objective. Well, so females screaming every time a boat comes within 100 yards of them when they first start boating. Yeah, it's like, I, you know, actually, that's a perceived threat. It's not an, it's not really an actual danger so much. Yeah. What was, what happens mentally to us when we have an alarm reaction? Tendency to freeze. <laughs> so. Um, I get, I, I was. Sorry, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? 
I was just going to say, I'm guessing that due to the glucose levels increase and your, your, your stimulus is sort of absorbing lots and lots of information from all parts of the body and desperately trying to process it as quickly as it can. Um, yeah, that's a very good way of putting it, actually. Um, so what happens is, is that you kind of go into like kind of, I know, hyper mode, basically. This, um, this is a picture of uh, one of the red jets docking in Southampton in Town Key. I don't if people are aware of the solar, these are just like a high speed catamaran that goes backwards and forwards. Um, I'll talk about my alarm reaction later, but I observed this one. We were coming in um, and as we come in, we transfer control from the center console out to the side console on the wing um, to allow you to get a view down the side of the vessel to berth. In order for that to happen, there's a series of three buttons that you need to press. What happened was, as we were coming in here, it's a little bit gusty. The person driving presses one of the buttons and then they walk over to the wing and then they come down. They try and press the second one or the third one, sorry, but it's not working because they forgot to press the second one. It's got to be done in a, in a sequence of three. They did the first one, missed out the middle bit and they tried to get control at the end. And so what they were doing was is that the red jet, now this aluminium catamaran with about 150 people on is now drifting about five knots towards the berth. And you go into an alarm reaction, which is, oh my goodness, I don't have any control, we're out of control. That produces a very high level of very focused attention, which is easy if I've stepped on a snake and my kind of reaction is, well, I just take my foot away and then run. But for a problem like this, it's not very good because this requires a little bit of analytical thinking to get to the bottom of the problem. And our problem solving ability actually decreases in this situation rather than increases. We go into that kind of uh, kind of mode where we can't really think. We can't really think rationally and we can't analyze any problem, which makes it very difficult when you're in a situation like this where the obvious thing would be, well, we just restart the process again. And we start from button number one, then we do button number two, then button number three. But hopefully you can appreciate, well, it's easy to have that thought here because I'm not in an alarm reaction. When you're actually in this kind of, um, this biological and physical um, and mental kind of turmoil, it's very difficult to solve that problem. There's also, it's interesting what you were saying, Julie, is that um, an alarm reaction is associated with a very strong urge to act. That is like, I've got to do something. I've got to do something right now to solve it. You said, um, uh, sorry, I noted this down, Julie. I hope you don't mind because I thought it was just perfect. Ready to jump at anything was what you said. And it was just like, right, I'm going to do something. I'm going to solve it. I've got to get out. But that's actually the worst thing that you can do, isn't it? Because actually the, the best thing to do would just to be to kind of think about it and go, all oh, right, um, okay, well, I'll just start by pressing button number one again. But that thought never occurred to them. And so we continued drifting with this person just waggling on the joystick and nothing happening. Um, and in, in the end, it was someone else on the bridge who was able to um, regain control at the center. And it wasn't until actually they, they birthed it from the center where control still was because they hadn't completed the process. They was able to bring it um, safely alongside. Um, and then they only found out that actually I missed, they missed the button afterwards. So high level of focused attention. Oh. Strong urge to act, problem solving ability decreases, and there's also a decrease in the ability to recall immediate information. So that is right, did I press button number two or not? I don't know. It's like, but I'm sure that in a normal situation, you'd be able to remember what you did 10 seconds ago. So short term information, information, <laughs> or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> so Information that I've gained over the short term, immediate before is lost, but my long term um, memory still works fine. So if you've taught someone a procedure for doing something and you've drilled it into them, you've practiced it, practiced it, practiced like a man overboard, they'll still be able to remember those steps. Does that make sense? Yes, repetition. Yeah. So, yeah, and part of that, part of that repetition, I think, so is um, is making sure that 
if it's an emergency thing like man overboard that we that when we drill them that we are addressing that um desire to go into overdrive so um trying to drill them to stop and think before they go into overdrive um and that i, I think is a key part of controlling an emergency situation isn't it is avoiding that flight um or panic moment really mm -hmm. yeah really really good that you basically cracked the rest of the session there um that's, kind of, that's what i was talking about <laughs> let's go through it systematically though so two things will happen basically you either act or you don't act if, when you're in that situation there's a strong urge to act and there's a strong urge to they call it um the desire to be part of an active solution solution that is i want to do something about this but the problem is is that that's a complete spur of the moment decision it involves no kind of rational thinking whatsoever um and so it may be lucky that what that kind of spur of the moment decision solves the problem or it may make things even worse in which case it makes it even worse and then you realize, oh God, it's even worse now. So I have an, another alarm reaction and then I'm back where I started. So this is called the fight or flight part of the response basically, is the urge to act and make a spur of the moment decision. It's really interesting. Um, there's, um, there's a couple of really good podcasts on this. I'll send out an email with, um, with some literature and, um, and some kind of case studies that I think are, are interesting in terms of this. Um, there's a quote by Terry Virts, who was a um, commander on the International Space Station. And Terry says, there is no emergency that you cannot make worse with a single action. I thought it's just absolutely perfect because this spur of the moment decision can actually just make things so much worse. Yeah. Alternatively, if people undergo an alarm reaction, they might not act and have a kind of freeze response. This means that basically, right, my ability to problem solve is really compromised. Because I can't problem solve, I can't understand the situation. I don't understand where the control's gone, what's going on, I've lost it, we're out of control. Failure to understand the problem. At which point, because I can't understand it, I can't muster any kind of presence of mind to make a decision. And so, I just don't make a decision, basically, and I just kind of wait and freeze. Also associated with denial that this is actually happening. Um, but that's called a freeze response. And it's kind of, um, we use the term fight, flight or freeze. That's actually incorrect. There's no such thing. What it is, is an alarm reaction. So fight, flight or freeze is a colloquial term it actually doesn't exist at all. It's just an alarm reaction to which people have two responses. They either kind of succumb to the urge to act or they fail to understand the problem. And then it's misdiagnosed as a freeze, fight or flight. So the good news then, because this is all kind of pretty bad, isn't it? is that you can quickly it's adapt. Depressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all hopeless. <laughs> Replace us with machines. Well, actually, <laughs> humans can be quite good at adapting to stress. And the alarm reaction fades after about five to 10 seconds, something like that. And after that, our ability to make decisions and to problem solve increases. The graph at the bottom of the screen here, this is called general adaption theory, which is where the alarm reaction and therefore the misdiagnosis of fight, flight or freeze responses comes from. You can see here over towards the left, we have a incident, we perceive an immediate threat at the top of the dip. Suddenly we dip down into that psychological response and our resistance to stress is lowered. At that point, we're just like, oh, I don't know what to do. However, after five to 10 seconds of that response, you see the graph creeping up again and our resistance to stress increases. 
until we get into the resistance phase, which is basically working to solve the problem. After we're working to solve the problem, our and the threat level comes down as we start to make progress. After we've been working, we fall into exhaustion, which is basically, if you've ever dealt with that kind of, Julie, I'm sure that when you came home after that, you were ready to put your feet up and just like sleep for a million years. Oh God, yeah. That's the exhaustion. A few, yeah. So you have the alarm reaction, opening it up and finding, oh my goodness, you know, we're taking on water. You have the resistance phase of, right, okay, let's problem solve and get this done. And then you have the exhaustion afterwards of, oh my goodness, my glucose levels are just like hit the floor. I just can't do anything. I can't make a decision. I just want to go to sleep. Now, the resistance phase doesn't mean like going back to normal and like, okay, being on kind of top performance. It just means your ability to deal with it is increasing. It's all relative. I mean, you're not going to, even at the height of the resistance stage, you're not going to kind of, I don't know, come up with a brilliant novel or something. You're still acting under a lot of stress and a lot of workload, which is something that humans aren't really very good at. But it shows you that the worst point to make a decision is in the dip in the alarm reaction. Is that clear? Yeah. So the thing is, is that we've got to wait for the alarm reaction to pass because that's the worst time that we can make a decision. That's when we're most compromised. Um, this is a picture um, from a Hawk jet um, over the Lake District. Um, and there's a, there's a blog online by a guy called um, Tim Davies, um, who's a fast jet instructor. Um, he's got some really, really useful things on there. I'd highly recommend checking out the vlog. This is a kind of screenshot from one of his articles. And it was talking about kind of what we've just um, spoken about now. And he was talking about, right, what's the first thing you do in an emergency when you realise something's really wrong? And he decided that, well, basically, the first thing you do is sit on your hands for five seconds and do nothing because... There's no emergency that you can't make worse with a single action. So you wait until that dip lasts and then you start acting and start actually kind of having a solution to the problem. Um, so, yeah, this is something that's, that's taught even to RAF pilots is that if something goes wrong, don't do anything for five seconds. Just wait. OK, gather yourself. Now we go into action. And that allows us to respond to emergencies rather than react to them. I, I'm not like I'm not just kind of reacting out of my mind. This is actually a considered response using condensed rational decision making, which is what Julie demonstrated earlier with the 10 times 40 adding the zero. That kind of logical thinking, but shortened, is the kind of thing we want to do in this kind of situation. So very, very important. We respond to emergencies. We don't react to them. Okay. So now the alarm reaction has passed and you think, right, I'm going to have to do something about this. As Bob said at the start, and I think as Gary mentioned earlier, we can only do so much. We can't multitask and I'm probably not going to be giving my best performance because this is really stressful. So I've got to prioritize what I'm going to do. And I can only really do those things. So the question is then, what do you prioritize? I've got three things here then. Most mnemonics in terms of human factors for dealing with um, stress come in threes because then you can be sure, well, I can remember my limit of working memory is three. You know, that's my lower limit. Yeah. I, most people can remember three, even at the worst time. So that's why we've got three things to choose. Okay. Try and come up with a kind of mnemonic for your three things that you think, right, in any situation, excluding a medical situation, by the way. So this is like, um, and I don't know much about sailing, I'm a powerboat instructor, but like a brooch or something, um, man overboard, something like that, um, 
thinking, engine fire. What generic three things are you going to think, right, I'm going to think about this first, then I'm going to think about this, and then I'm going to think about this. Have a think about it, um, and then pop your answers on the chat. Hmm. <laughs> Yay, we are safe. That's four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was trying to think of something I could remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Peter. Now we now we're getting onto it. Thinking about people, thinking about the boat, and then thinking about a plan. Um, excuse my ignorance, but I seem to the only person I seem to be able to chat to is Gary Martin at the moment. Ah, uh, so if you go on to your you, if you go on to chat, yeah, it'll say above type message here, it'll say two. Ah, right, I see. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm with you. you. Go right up to the top and you click everyone, everybody, breathe person. Okay, nice. Stop safety recover. I really like that one. That one. Yeah, I was trying to think of an ana um, of a an acronym for the uh, for for stop think act. That's why I put. Why at the end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. Oh, there's some really good ones in there. Yeah, nice. Um, could you explain, um, Paul, the stop safety recover? That one's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, when when I do um, sort of man overboard training, um, you know, obviously there's far more than three points that you tend to demonstrate in terms of the whole procedure. So what I try and do is is break it down into um, chunks. Um, and my first sort of chunk effectively is, is to stop the boat, um, to hold station on the casualty and just to give thinking time. Hmm. Um, and then I say the next chunk is make the boat safe. Um, because we don't want a second casualty and that making the boat safe will include everything from getting the main under control, getting the head sill away, making sure there's no ropes over the side, you know, and all those things, you know, mayday, um, you know, the whole, the whole safety shebang. Um, and then once you've done those two things, then think about your recovery. Um, and that's the way I break it down because it's, as I say, there's so many sort of nuances to a man overboard. Mm. Um, I find students just get overwhelmed by all, all the things they have to think about and they panic a little bit about, you know, even demonstrating it with a fender in front of their peers. Mm. Um, so what I just try and break it down into, into chunks. I say, let's compartmentalize it into this stopping procedure, um, into this safety procedure and then into this recovery procedure and, and that's that's the way I, I find works for me yeah that's a really nice one I mean I mean that's why we're doing this is that essentially there's so much to do if you don't prioritize you end up spending a lot of time and effort on something that doesn't really produce much of a result um, so yeah I, I completely see I completely see your point there's a lot to do and I can't focus on something that kind of isn't really important at the moment. I've got to prioritize. I really like the, um, yeah, this. Okay. So the first thing I do is sit on my hands. I'm just going to stop the boat and then go from there, stop the boat, wait for that alarm reaction to pass. Now I'm going to think about people's safety. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to take action last after I've thought about people's safety. Um, Alex doesn't have to be a mnemonic can be like an initialism or acronym or 
whatever. Um, it doesn't really matter. I like the, um, uh, what's another one? Um, uh, Nikki, threat to life resources in action. Could you explain that one, please? Uh, so yeah, so after stopping, um, I, I guess my initial thought would be, is there a threat to life? Is somebody in danger? That's the most important thing. Um, and then what resources do I have available to me? So perhaps a mayday, other people on the other crew members, um, equipment on the boat, etc., that could help. Um, and then decide what I'm going to do and take that action. Okay. Yeah, nice. And I mean, um, I suppose in terms of like um, speaking from a, a kind of health and safety point of view, I mean, what's our, what's our priority there? Like, okay, preserving life. Um, preventing serious injury and then we go on to equipment in the environment afterwards i like resources once it, once we know that um, people are going to actually survive this and have a meaningful life afterwards um so yeah i i really like that one um uh hayley breathe persons and surroundings hold on yeah um so breathe mainly just to try and get control of your heart rate and just trying mm. to stop the um, the first thing you do then is not force yourself into one of those situations where you make more of a, a situation worse than it was already. So I've just put breathe, just it's that five seconds sit on your hands. But if you think to breathe, then you're straight away trying to lower your heart rate, maybe make some better decisions. And then assign to any situation, whether it is MOB or a fire, what, 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 what processes do I need, need to follow to keep the person safe? Uh, and then trying to move away from that tunnel vision on the boat, you know, thinking, OK, what's around me as well? Am I going into a hazard? How is that fire going to link to that? Or if there's an MOB, what's my wave height? You know, have I got an engine? All of those considerations. So I just thought that, that was a way of looking at it slightly differently. Yeah, really nice. Really, I like, um, I'm just looking at um, Alex's as well. What do I think has happened? What has happened? What am I going to do about it? That's really interesting. And that... Um, that ties into um, emergency communication as well. Um, we use a um, mnemonic called NITS when we're um, communicating kind of internally. So say, for example, um, if I was on watch and I call the captain or I call the engine room and I say, right, let's say, for example, I'm alongside a port and I get a sudden gust of wind and then the the ship breaks her mooring lines and she starts to drift away from the pier. I've got to call the engine room and I've got to tell them basically what's going on and what I need. There's been quite a few instances where basically communication in an emergency hasn't broke down. And this happened on a cruise ship was that that exact scenario, mooring lines have broke, the ship, the ship is now drifting to shallow water and they called up the engine room and think, right, okay, good. That's that's done. And then five minutes later, there were still no engines. And it usually takes about one and a half to two minutes. And I thought, well, why is that? And he said, so they call them back up again and say, well, why haven't we got any engines? This is an emergency. We're about to go ground. And the engineer replied like, oh, OK, I was just calling the engineer. We were just doing some checks and stuff before we start up. It's like, no, no, we need them right now. And the result of that was that they thought, right, well, what we need is a standardized procedure to kind of brief someone and request something in an emergency. And they came up with the mnemonic NITS. NITS stands for nature, intention, time, and special. So if I was to call down to the engine room, I would say our mooring lines have broken, we're drifting into shallow water. My intention is to get engines and thrusters back to maneuver alongside the berth. I need them now, nothing special. And then that's a really concise way of saying, this is what's happening. This is what I need at this moment. This is when I need it by. And then special basically means anything else that you, can, that you, might, um, that you might think of. So you might say, I need engines and one thruster or something like that. That's what we would use in um, in like a commercial maritime um, setting. So you're very, I mean, I think it has, um, it has its place on, on a yacht as well. Um, in terms of the, <clears throat> going back to the mnemonics, initialisms and priorities, I'll give you two. 
The one on the left is from NASA in 2006. It says control of the, um, it just says control, but obviously we'll be talking about control of the boat rather than control of the space shuttle. So NASA came up with this acronym when they were doing their flight training and it's incorporated into all of their checklists. They say the first thing is control. If I don't have control of the boat, there's no point doing anything. So for example, in a brooch, I have no control over the boat. So there's no point thinking about going aground because I don't have any control. I need to get control back first. Second, analyze the situation, what's happening. And then third is take action. My one um, that is kind of a hybrid um, of a couple of ones I've seen. First of all, control of the boat. I can't do anything unless I've got control. Second is safety of navigation. So when I get control back, I don't just want to like run it aground. I need to make a considered choice. And then third, I'll enact that plan. So for example, um, we were taught um, on simulators. Let's say, for example, you have um, a steering gear failure. You think, oh my goodness, right, the alarms are going off everywhere. I've, I thought I was making a turn to port and now I've just lost steering. I don't know what's going on. What's my first thing that I do? Right, I get control of the vessel. Once it's under control, I think about safety of navigation. Am I gonna go, go aground or do I need to alter course because now I've got control? And then I'll take that alteration into safe water. So very welcome to use those, but I also really like some of your own, I think are kind of more suited to perhaps like the, the RYA environment we're going in. Um, but that is, what, um, that is what people use kind of on, um, on large ships and, um, and also within NASA and the aviation industry. Lastly, um, support. So thinking about this kind of from a center's point of view now, the things that we can do, say, for example, you were a principal or chief instructor, you've got a couple of, um, of instructors to manage. The kind of things that we can do to support them in an emergency situation. Um, the first one is opportunities to learn. So that is, okay, so if you have any kind of abnormal situations, well, then it's a good idea to get the whole team around and talk about it in a kind of, um, in an open, non-judgmental way and say, right, this happened on board one of, our, one of our boats. What happened? What was going on at the time? What were you feeling? What was your reaction? We understand it's not going to be perfect, but we're trying to learn the lesson so that we can improve for next time. Um, there's a lot of work about this kind of going into um, cultures of continuous learning and ultimately everything that we've talked about here is because people have taken the opportunities to learn rather than to judge people. Um, drills, we talked about earlier, okay right, kind of um, instilling that kind of long-term firm memory of the actions to take so that even though my short-term memory and my alarm reaction is going on, I can still fall back on those kind of learnt um, kind of instinctual actions. Procedures can also really help um, in kind of um, in managing human factors, both in terms of like, okay, so we have a requirement to have a safety briefing and so on um, to kind of develop situational awareness and checklists as well. Checklists are a really big, um, are one of the things that I'm really passionate about because they take the memory side out of it. I do my priorities and then I go to the checklist and I make sure that I've done it, done everything. I can't trust myself to remember everything in that alarm situation. So even a little card on the dash for like a man overboard, um, you know, just ticking off like, okay, right, I've done the maybe, I've got the person on board, so on, um, can be really helpful so that you're not having to use your brain too much when your brain really isn't working for you. Can anyone think of anything else to add to that list, just as an open question? Not as an ad, but I, I have found that with checklists, they need to be shorter rather than longer. Otherwise, people just tend to auto tick. I, I don't know. So that's a, a keeping your checklists um, a, a, to a level that's usable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a checklist, people miss, I think people, um, people misunderstand checklists and they miswrite checklists. Checklist is not an exhaustive list. 
it's just a list of the key things that if you don't do them, you'll be in really big trouble. It's not just like everything that you have to do. It's just the really key things. So yeah, absolutely right. I mean, that's, um, that's been a big problem um, in industry that we're kind of in the maritime industry, the aviation industry kind of got over it a long time ago, but in the maritime industry and the construction industry, they're kind of only just getting to that point now that you can't cover everything in a checklist. You've got to decide what's really important. Yeah, really nice point. I think the only thing just talking about continuous improvement and everything and using those sort of like industrial commercial sort of elements is review is, mm. is coming back just completing your loop is after checklist review come back to opportunities to learn and then run back through mm. how you change and develop that and keep it up to date mm. Mm. yeah um yeah absolutely like kind of not getting um not getting stagnant i suppose yeah, I, I really like, um, I mean, I would recommend, um, even if you if you can, just kind of, um, there's quite a lot of MAIB reports um, to go through, and there's quite a few on, on small vessels. I would recommend, if you get a chance, like at one of them, um, if you have like a kind of monthly meeting or a quarterly meeting, they say like every couple of months, we're just going to go through one of those reports. And we're just going to we're going to do exactly what we did. It can even be a YouTube video like we did and say, right, I'm going to think about what happened and the lessons learned and how vulnerable our setup is to those same things. You know, like we are vulnerable to change blindness. We are vulnerable to sometimes getting a bit stuck in our own perception of the world and and not updating our situational awareness. Um, we can't override these basic human limitations. They're just within everyone. The only thing you can do is be aware of them so that you know when it's happening. Cool. Um, any other questions from the um, from anything that we've covered? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, well, we've reached the end. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that was really really useful Aidan that was um kind of putting things into context from my old life which was risk management in aviation and health and safety and fire into into boats and it's nice to see it translating now a little oh, bit where I've not seen it before yeah oh fantastic yeah I'm glad you enjoyed it that was good thank you Steve and I thank you so much for giving up your time to give a very valuable information to, to everybody it was really interesting and really well taught yeah. thank you yeah my yeah. pleasure yeah thanks very much thank Aiden. That, um, that was uh, really really interesting i uh, you know picked up an awful lot and um yeah really appreciate your time and effort going into that thank you oh thank you, thank you. Thank you. yeah no thanks yeah. Aiden. it was really really good really enjoyed that yeah. lots of points to reflect on lovely yeah well thank you very much everybody it's been a pleasure i've enjoyed it too <laughs> <laughs> it's not as scary once you get started <laughs> 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 Another ghost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, being ghosts. Well, thank you. Thank you like. very will, much. Um, if you like, I will send out an email with a couple of um, a couple of case studies and a couple a bits of um, bits of literature and so on that I found kind of quite quite useful in helping to to make this. And um, I can send you the slides as well if you want them. Um, yes, yeah. please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll send. I'll um, probably. Um, I've got another session coming up at two. I'll probably send them out tonight. Okay. Oh. Well, <laughs> Steve will probably have a chat with you about that and about the recordings and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. You very much, everybody. Thanks, Aid. Cheers, guys. Have a good Bye. one. Bye. 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 Bye.